morning. This Good day morning. reminds us how far science and medicines have progressed. Cheers to the anniversary of the historical event today and wish everyone a very happy World Anesthesia Day. Good morning and warm welcome to Online Anesthesia. It is a postgraduate teaching program on Zoom platform sponsored by Akurla and hosted by A1 Logics and aired by Anesthesia TV. Today we are having two important topics in pediatric anesthesia. The first one is NORA, that is non-operating room anesthesia, and second one is the anesthesia daycare surgery in pediatrics. For that, we have two eminent speakers in our online platform, Dr. Dinesh Kumar and Gunasegaran and Raki, Dr. Raki Goyal. I welcome both to the online anesthesia mm -hmm. platform. The first speaker, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, is a consultant pediatric anesthesiologist of GKN in GKNM Hospital of Coimbatore. He has completed a hospital administration course, fellowship in pediatric anesthesiology. He has undergone observership in pediatric anesthesia in many countries like Switzerland, US, South Africa, and Belgium. He has delivered many guest lectures in various CME and conferences. He, is a, he has got gold medal in MBBS and MD. He is the executive member of Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesiologists. And he is the course director of IAPA Fellowship in GKNM Hospital. He has published many research papers in pediatric anesthesia. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the kind words. And uh, at this onset, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy World Anesthesia Day. Um, uh, just a second. My screen is visible, sir. No. Share it. Yes, sir. It's visible. Sir. Okay. So my topic for today is uh, NORA in pediatrics, which is non-operating room anesthesia. And I bring uh, greetings from uh, Kupsaminada Memorial Hospital, Coimbatore. And coincidentally, we celebrate the 70th year uh, of our hospital inauguration this year. So, NORA is nothing but administration of anesthesia, sedation, or monitored anesthesia care to patients undergoing painful or uncomfortable procedures at offsite locations. Uh, most of our work, uh, at least 25 to 35% of a regular institutional pediatric anesthesiology practice comprises of NORA. And NORA is more commonly required in uh, pediatrics than in adults. And the most important thing here is we go out of a comfort zone, which is the operation theater to provide NORA. So we have uh, our, its own challenges. So most of the time when we go for a NORA, uh, we see that the child is, uh, you know, in a very stressful situation. But what uh, we don't know that this is how the child is looking at us. But what the child does not know that know is we are also e equally scared about Nora, and you know we are equally uh, paranoid about uh, uh, the procedure, mainly because it's out of a comfort zone. Uh, the staff equipment and help in emergency is very limited or at least it takes a longer time than in the operation theater to reach us. And the risk and complications due to adverse events is potentially high. And the recognition time of the risk and adverse events is also uh, takes a longer time than in the operation theaters. And these kids who come for di uh, NORA procedures tend to have uh, multiple comor comorbidities and uh, uh, they also have had their own share of uh, previous anesthetics. So they're very paranoid when they come uh, for the uh, procedure the next time, the next time, the next time. As long as they're comfortable, they get more comfortable. Once they're paranoid, they get uh, even more anxious for the uh, uh, subsequent anesthetics. And these children have a higher risk of uh, anatomical and physiological variations, which are undiagnosed. Because most of them for, come for diagnostic procedures. Even the, uh, the physician also does not know the diagnosis. So it has its own risks. And these days, uh, kids uh, have a very increased sensitivity to pain. So uh, in previous uh, generations, the kids who used to tolerate uh, uh, 
small procedures. Now we have uh, uh, the need to give anesthesia even for these smaller procedures where pain can be tolerated. And there is a lot of uh, advent of uh, new interventions with uh, more uh, enhancement in uh, neuro, cardiac, uh, minimally invasive procedures and all that. The need to give Nora is more. And there are also other challenges like communication issues where in the Nora scenarios, the mobile phones don't work, the telephones don't work. Uh, half the time we reach that first, we wait for the uh, technician to come, we wait for the suction to work, we wait for the oxygen to be there, we wait for the scopes. So it's uh, the, the communication is, issue is always a problem there. And uh, there is increased incidence of airway complications. Always there can be an unavailability of medication and equipment. Uh, frequent malfunctions because they are not very regularly used. Maybe uh, that could also be another reason. And oftentimes we come across syndromic sick children. And uh, another important challenge is there are undiagnosed myopathies and uh, neuropathies, uh, inadequate uh, pre preparation, and there is also radiation hazard to the personnel. So, oftentimes we are like here sitting in like a pilot in the uh, war zone, and these are the people which includes the surgeon, the technician who take their own full time to load things and do things. But here we are trying to balance the whole uh, situation. So Dr. Ramesh, my mentor, he always says, uh, do not get into trouble without knowing how to get out of the trouble. So I think that applies in Nora scenarios. But saying all the negative things, the positive thing is, uh, this is a study uh, uh, done by Dr. Peter Davis. So a pediatric Nora by well-trained personnel is rarely accompanied by mortality and major morbidity. Presence of skilled anesthesiologists capable of airway rescue can avert catastrophic outcomes and the rate of morbidity and mortality decreases if ancillary personnel are trained, uh, ensure that the participating staff are adequately trained to assist in NORA. Uh, this is the, Dr. Joseph Tobias. He is the chief of uh, uh, pediatric anesthesia at Nationwide Children's Hospital and I had the opportunity to, to uh, intern with him for one month in the US. And uh, this is his collaborative study with uh, uh, pediatric, uh, so, uh, pediatric Society in the US combined with Pediatric Anesthesia Society. So they formed a, a thing where uh, critical elements for pediatric perioperative anesthesia environment was framed. And that says pre-procedural preparation, which includes a thorough clinical evaluation, uh, ASIC grading, and uh, always uh, make sure that high-risk pediatric patients consult anesthesiologists with a subspecialty certification or experience uh, in pediatric anesthesia, which means who dedicate at least 25% of their uh, clinical practice to neonates and children. And uh, basic essential investigations, even if it is not there, please make sure that we get it done before we do the procedure, like CBC, serology, urea creatine, mainly because oftentimes uh, a contrast is used. Uh, and standard fasting guidelines uh, sometimes may not even apply to endoscopy procedures. I'll be speaking in detail about it. Um, written informed consent from the parents and guardians, uh, optimization of the anesthetic plan and ventilation strategies uh, according to the child's age and requirement, arrangement of essential equipment in accordance to the procedure plan, non-pharmacological interventions such as uh, distraction, oftentimes uh, we see that uh, just giving a mobile phone uh, to the child when the, when the procedure is being done sorts the whole thing. Uh, Pre-medication only if warranted. Uh, preparation of only the essential only the essential drugs don't have uh, on the table unnecessary drugs because unlike an OT, uh, we don't know when we ask for flush, we might get some other drug which we might uh, accidentally inject to the child and always load the drug and keep only what is required for the weight of that specific child. And uh, our first rule we all know is primum non nos here, which is first do no harm. And... Uh, at least these basic things, suction, oxygen devices, airway, positioning, uh, monitors and equipments, and equipments of rescue like crash cart, defibrillator, I would also say ETCO2 here, if possible to be kept ready. Uh, you'll be surprised to know that even though we might have kept all these ready, the suction might not be working when we need, when we need it really, oxygen might not be delivering, the laryngoscope light might not be working. So make sure everything is properly checked and kept. We don't know when we'll need it. From the patient's side, this is a pain drawing of a 10-year-old child with a severe headache. 
So imagine this child going into an MRI suit with more sound and all that. So uh, I would rather say, if the child needs an anesthetic, please don't deny the child of anesthetic just uh, because uh, the situation is not conducive. So the most common Nora, Nora scenarios that we do is uh, in the imaging suits, CT, MRI, and uh, we do ultrasound guided biopsies. In the bronchoscopy suit, uh, we have uh, diagnostic bronchoscopy. We, we do foreign body removals. Uh, we do uh, PEG, where the surgeon and the endoscopist uh, combine together. Then we have the oncology and radiotherapy suits, where we do a lot of daily therapy, chemo ports. We insert a lot of PIC lines. We also do a lot of uh, cardiac and uh, neuro, in neuro interventional cath lab procedures. Uh, we do a lot of diagnostic procedures, uh, a lot of daycare procedures. Dental, dental itself is, uh, is a topic where uh, so many procedures, dental procedures are done. Ortho, burns, dressings. And uh, we also come under NORA scenarios in uh, dermatological and cosmetology uh, procedures where ear piercing, water removal, mole skin tag removals. So we'll take one by one in detail. Uh, we'll start with uh, GA endoscopy. So GA endoscopy is uh, either done for diagnostic or uh, therapeutic procedures. And uh, it's mostly done for uh, upper GA, lower GA or e ERCP. So this is our uh, endoscopy suit. Uh, this is a child who has undergone a PEG where uh, a surgeon is also involved. Uh, OGD scopies, it might range from uh, two minutes to 20 minutes, but the problem is uh, the uh, procedure is highly stimulating. There is a thick, uh, a rich uh, nervous system uh, in the area where uh, though the procedure might be shorter, we need to keep the child in a deeper plane. And another important thing is we have to know our endoscopist. So if uh, accordingly we give an anesthesia, accordingly we give the drugs, accordingly if we need, we intubate the child, accordingly if we can, we try to just sedate the child. And uh, so everything depends on the endoscopist. So know your endoscopist. Uh, most of the diagnostic GA endoscopies can be managed without intubation, uh, whereas therapeutic might need intubation in pediatrics. Uh, like variceal banding, uh, foreign body removals, stent placements and removals, uh, pig placements, definitely we need a GA. Sometimes even a caudal is given. Uh, and we must also know why, why the endoscopy is being done. And the fasting guidelines, which I was talking about, though the child might be fasted for six hours or four hours or two hours, we might still see some milk or uh, uh, solid food when we go inside. So uh, always consider these children as full stomach. These kids might have an increased intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, the airway always decide uh, based on the child if a mask is enough or if you need a definitive airway. And be very cautious with the fasting guidelines. Uh, induction, there is always a doubt if an IV or an inhalation is uh, uh, preferred. So you choose accordingly. So this is a scenario where we need two anesthetists, where one is putting the line. And you can see the child comfortable, where another anesthetist is holding the mask with the CO4 in, of course. And another thing which we have to concentrate is always have a bite block. These uh, uh, GA scopies are very expensive. In case the child bites, then uh, the endoscopist is going to take us also for a soup. And uh, please make sure that you expose the abdomen and keep all the time. Uh, because uh, in air, uh, during endoscopy, there's a lot of air in circulation and the stomach might uh, get big. Uh, this might compromise with the ventilation. There is also a lot of gastric distension. And uh, once the procedure is done, inform your endoscopist to suction out the air before re removing the endoscope. Uh, why we emphasize this, we've come across a lot of situations where the child is malnourished. And uh, uh, when the endoscopist is overzealous, something like this happens. So this is a pneumoperitoneum where uh, uh, there was a perforation and uh, uh, ultimately we didn't, we were uh, uh, not able to ventilate the child. The lung was completely pushed up. We were not able to ventilate the child. And ultimately we were saved uh, just putting a needle and uh, deflating the stomach. Uh, airway intubation will be needed for most therapeutic maneuvers. Uh, diagnostic endoscopy, spontaneous breathing patient is acceptable. And always can, uh, 
bear it in mind that it's a shared airway between the endoscopist and us. Anesthesia, propofol, fentanyl, or ketamine. Uh, you know, we need we need uh, something to you know uh, antitussive uh, tube tolerance and analgesia. So aim for a deep plane of anesthesia because of the rich nerve endings around the uh, larynx and pharynx. So how do we judge the depth, the timing of endoscope insertion? Uh, once we give propofol and when there is an apnea, yes, that's a good time to go. You can ask your endoscopist to proceed. And uh, another tip is when the pupils are uh, central and looking perpendicularly up, that means the child is in a deeper plane and again, we can proceed. And after a propofol bolus, when the respiration is regular and slow, again, that time the child is deep and we can go ahead with endoscopy. Other indications for intubation, uh, though it might be a therapeutic procedure or sorry, a diagnostic procedure, when the child has a very poor apnea tolerance, something like a small child, distended abdomen, uh, ascites, uh, we straight away go for intubation. And when there is a higher risk of upper airway events like uh, upper respiratory tract infection and asthma, again, we go for intubation. We come across a lot of esophageal stricture dilatations where uh, we have to anticipate residual food above the stricture. And post-operative, once the stricture is dilated, please watch for signs of uh, esophageal perforation, uh, which might present with severe pain, tachycardia, and sometimes uh, uh, later post-op, the child might have a fever. And uh, watch for uh, pneumothorax, mediastinal layer in X-ray. We've had a lot of situations. Uh, lower GI or colonoscopy. Uh, the most important thing is these children are constipated. They have uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, where a lot of steroids are given, or the child may be uh, having severe diarrhea where the electrolytes uh, uh, may be abnormal. Uh, malnutrition and failure to thrive. These children have the, their own set of complications. Uh, these colonoscopy procedures are longer procedures. Always watch for dehydration. Uh, there might be um, uh, constriction of the um, colon and the uh, endoscopist might require to require us to give some tyrosine. Uh, these procedures are more painful. Uh, the technique that we can use is we can either keep the child in spontaneous or use an LMA if the procedure is long. Or sometimes we can even uh, use CO sedation uh, and oxygen by uh, Hudson mask and prongs. Uh, the most commonly used drugs, midazolam pre-medication only for extremely anxious child because we need to wake them up post the procedure. We try to avoid midazolam. Uh, fentanyl, uh, one mic, ketamine, one mg, dexmed, one mic, propofol, one mg. Uh, CO of scavenging is adequate. And uh, please you give adequate IV fluids because they are dehydrated for all lower GI endoscopy procedures. So next is uh, bronchoscopy. We do a lot of bronchoscopies. These are more challenging than the GA endoscopies. The airway is again shared. Uh, it's done in even smaller kids, less than six months, uh, to rule out uh, bronchomalacia and tracheomalacia. Uh, diagnostic, we do a lot of anatomy assessment, and you need to keep the child spontaneously breathing to know the dynamic uh, environment of the trachea so that we know the collapsibility, we know the tracheal lumen. Once we paralyze, we lose the tone and uh, uh, they're not able to diagnose what the actual problem is. And sometimes in therapeutic, uh, we, use, uh, uh, the, we, uh, we use bronchoscopy for uh, uh, lavage, removal of mucus plugs and also foreign bodies. Airway, uh, we can either have the child spontaneously breathing. Uh, sometimes we can use intermittent mask technique. Uh, we can use a conduit LMA. Most often the uh, normal LMA has an aperture which uh, will block the, uh, uh, the bronchoscope from passing. So the most commonly uh, used is uh, Proceal. And Proceal is a good choice because we can also deflate the stomach. And very often we use the swivel connector. Through this, we can insert the uh, bronchoscope. Uh, so the LMA and the size of the bronchoscope, most commonly we'll be using 1.52 or 2.5 for these kids. And uh, uh, in a 1.5 size LMA, a 3 mm bronchoscope can pass. In 2 and 2.5, 3.5 and 4 uh, uh, mm bronchoscopes can pass. 
uh, and the next common procedure for bronchoscopy for uh, the foreign bodies uh, removal of aspirated foreign body from the trachea and bronchus uh, ga with lma uh, when we need to use a fiber optic bronchoscope removal um, mostly a basket for removing a peanut or something like that rigid bronchoscopy when there is a central foreign body it's a very true emergency and uh, very challenging and uh, I we always, uh, you know, uh, when you have to give uh, excessive positive pressure, be very careful because you may cause pneumothorax. Jet ventilation may be useful, but can push the foreign body further. Shared airway and uh, limited working space is concerned to the uh, added difficulties of a remote location. Uh, use of adequate anti secretory medication definitely makes a lot of difference. And uh, losing the airway followed by rapid desaturation and bradycardia is the most commonly encountered complication when you know you deal with a foreign body. So see, very often how I try to uh, judge the child is when the child desaturates once and uh, we ventilate the child and the saturation immediately picks up. It means it's a good child. The, we, 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 we can uh, you know let the saturation go even uh, fall down further uh, and give enough time for the endoscopist or the surgeon to remove the foreign body. But once it takes a longer time for you to ventilate and pick up the saturation. That is when you have to be worried. That means the lung is bad. Uh, the child has some other cardiac issues. Or that's when you know it, the, it takes a longer time for the saturation to pick up. And always involve a senior or specialized pediatric anesthetist, anesthetist in such scenarios. So here you can see the swivel connector through which uh, the bronchoscopy is passed. So how do we do it? We use a lot of anti glyco glycopyrrolate, 5 to 10 mics per kg. We uh, use dexamethasone default, uh, fentanyl when needed. Uh, and uh, when we use intermittent techniques, there's something called the seoflurin bolus, where you keep 8%, take them deep. And uh, once you cut it, give them back to the uh, bronco, give the child back to the bronco bronchoscopist for, do for doing the procedure. And uh, when you don't want to pollute the environment, please use propofol bolus. Jet ventilation helps. And uh, post-op bronchodilator and adrenaline nebulization also helps. And like I said, for endoscopists, always know your bronchoscopist as well. It's the it's like a marriage between uh, the bronchoscopist and us because you need to uh, let the child desaturate when they are working. And uh, the more time you give them, uh, they'll be it'll be easier for them to pick up the foreign body and come out. So you need to have a better understanding with your bronchoscopist. Uh, post operative always expect cough bronchospasm and uh, glottic edema. Uh, Adrenal nebulization, one in uh, 1000 dilution, two to four ml for nebulization works well. So the next uh, we'll move to radiological procedures. Again, remote monitoring. The most common procedures are CT and MRI. Common indications, uh, the, the, uh, they come for a, glo a global developmental delay. Uh, when the child has a first seizure, seizure episode, they may come to us. Uh, neuro tumors, hydrocephalus, spinal dysphagism, and non neuro, they might come for uh, ortho and GI procedures. Durations mostly MRI brain takes around 20 minutes, abdomen again 20 minutes, spine uh, takes around 30 to 40 minutes, and specific organs like uh, cardiac MRI and all that takes around 40 to 60 minutes. Need for sedation in MRI because we want the child to be absolutely immobile and uh, we don't want any artifacts. Sometimes post contrast, we may need them to hold their breath. And some kids are very claustrophobic, and uh, that might be one specific reason we need to sedate them. So, monitoring problem specific for MRI is monitoring, which is remote monitoring. Metal objects, projectile missiles. We know the Mumbai incident where uh, uh, the oxygen cylinder was stuck. And uh, in between, the technician was there between the MRI machine and the oxygen cylinder. I think we lost him. Uh, access, again, uh, once the child is inside and we are outside, the access becomes an issue. Noise, uh, the duration. And uh, we all know that uh, the MRI suit is very cold to maintain the temperature of the uh, machine. Uh, the environment is maintained very hypotherm. So please keep the child very warm. And always protect your personal equipments like phone, cards, uh, all our ATM cards, once we by, take inside the MRI suit by mistake, it doesn't work once you come out. Keys, etc., which might again be projectile missiles. So, this is our MRI suit where you can see the baby completely draped warm. We just sedated. 
we have the luxury of having a MRI compatible anesthesia machine inside. You can see the CO floor in here. And uh, another uh, thing that we have adapted over time where we can uh, avoid all the hullabula is, is a med bag. Uh, it's just a, a infant Im immobilizer where uh, once you take the air out, the uh, uh, med bag engulfs over the child. So just feed the child completely. Comfortable, the child, once the child is comfortable and sleeping, you can just engulf in this med bag. And this is how the child is once uh, in the med bag suit. Uh, this way we can avoid a lot of anesthetics. See now more talks about neurotoxicity, uh, repeated anesthetics. Med bag helps a lot, especially in children less than 10 kilos. A CT with contrast. Uh, we have this technique of uh, just uh, using CO sedation because they need to go back home or they need to go back to the ward. Instead of giving IV, we just uh, give a CO sedation, a, a bolus of CO, something like 8%. For two minutes and then cut the C1 and come out. And C1, uh, CT is a very small procedure. The child has to go in and come out hardly a minute or so. And CO sedation is, uh, is more than good. And once the procedure is over, you just give a small uh, um, uh, stimulus, the child wakes up. And there is a, most of the time, there is a request for apnea where uh, we've developed this technique over years where you first hyperventilate the child and then you give a bolus dose of propofol then the child remains apneic for some time where within that time the procedure is done. And uh, contrast induced allergy and anaphylaxis is always a concern and contrast induced renal failure, uh, dehydration, pre-existing renal disease, juvenile diabetes, watch for all these. Uh, we must know that uh, the effects of contrast could be either hypotension, sometimes hypertension, where the extravascular fluid moves intravascular, uh, diuresis, and uh, the effects of the contrast is directly proportional to the hypertonicity of the contrast. But these days, most of the uh, contrasts that are available in the market are isotonic. So I think it shouldn't be a problem anymore. And uh, uh, definitely the risk of radiation is very significant than we think actually. It's cumulative, leads to malignancy, cataracts. Uh, always try to use scans which do not use radiation like MRI. Protect yourself and the child, use aprons, lead goggles, thyroid shields. Uh, please use dosimeters and check your annual dosages. See, what we don't know is uh, exposure to radiation from natural sources just gives around 3 to 4 millisieverts. Uh, one chest x is equal to 0.1 millisievert. But just one CT chest or uh, a CT abdomen is 10 millisieverts, uh, which is equal to 100 chest x-rays. Uh, there is a procedure called PET-CT, which is also done, that gives an exposure of around 25 millisieverts, which is equal to 250 uh, chest X-rays. So we actually don't know what the radiation is doing to these kids or to us. You, so use it judiciously. The next most commonly done uh, NORA procedures are interventional uh, cardiology procedures, where uh, uh, occlusion devices for congenital heart disease, balloon dilatation, valvuloplasties for uh, valvular lesions, uh, electrophysiological studies like uh, uh, permanent pacemaker insertions, all these are done. For these kids, a thorough PAC has to be done. Please ask for history of cyanosis, shortness of breath, uh, signs and symptoms of congestive cardiac failure, previous surgical or uh, cardiac intervention, which has already been done. Please check what anticoagulant therapy they're on and uh, the other cardiac medications that they're taking. Uh, Sorry, just a second. Uh, most of the times in a uh, cardiac uh, cath lab, we might need GA and sometimes only sedation. So always check for adequate perfusion of systemic and uh, pulmonary circulation, filling pressures, heart rate, and uh, coronary perfusion pressures definitely need to be maintained. Uh, sometimes if needed, an invasive monitoring and uh, blood gas analysis may be needed. Uh, at times when uh, TEE needs to be uh, done, always plan it uh, as a GA. So this is our uh, cardiac cath lab where you can see a lot of equipment. Child, we are in one corner. You can see the long tubing monitors and the anesthesia machine here. 
uh, we also do a lot of uh, neuro interventional radiology procedures uh, where we do them through endovascular approach uh, embolization of uh, cerebral and dural av malformations coiling of cerebral aneurysm thrombolysis and uh, balloon dilatation of vessels uh, it warrants adequate resuscitation maintenance of cerebral perfusion pressures and control of uh, intracranial pressure uh, most often we do it under ga uh, to tackle the hemodynamic instability and ensure normal thermia uh, complications uh, very often we we come across uh, hemorrhage thromboembolic phenomena coil occlusions and uh, cerebral vasospasms so this is a biplane cath lab where uh, again you can see the anesthesia machine here the long tubings uh, the access to the child becomes difficult when they're doing the procedure we have to go we have to do all yoga procedures to go and you know check uh, check the child in between uh, so other nora scenarios uh, ortho cast applications they come for uh, repeated anesthetics burns dressings uh, which need moderate uh, sedation or tiva uh, dental anesthesia dental procedures that itself is a, a completely uh, a single topic and my favorite is using this uh, uh, atomizer uh, where without an IV line, we do a lot of dental procedures. We use uh, dexmedetomidine, uh, we use midazolam, we use ketamine, and it works very well. Uh, as long as, uh, once you master the technique, you get very comfortable with uh, doing it without an IV line. Uh, adequate supplementation of local anesthesia wherever possible. See, wherever you have a nerve, whenever possible, please do block it. And Nora scenario drastically brings down the requirement of other drugs. Uh, we do a lot of ultrasound guided biopsies, brachytherapy sedation, uh, and uh, diagnostic procedures don't uh, give very high doses of uh, any drug because you just need mild sedation. You don't uh, have to give any analgesics. So this is uh, renal biopsy where uh, you can see the child in prone position, but still we are comfortably sedate. And uh, before piercing the Radiologist gives adequate uh, sedation, I mean, adequate local infiltration so that the child does not feel any pain at all. The renal biopsy, ultrasound guided renal biopsy. Uh, so, the sedation spectrum, we all know that minimal sedation, where the patient responds to verbal commands, moderate sedation, verbal commands only with uh, addition of mild stimulus. So, these two, please prefer them only for. Uh, Diagnostic procedures do not use my minimal sedation and moderate sedation for therapeutic procedures. Any therapeutic procedure, please keep them deep or straight away go for a GA. I usually prefer either a deep sedation or a GA. Avoid them for therapeutic. So, two important pharmacokinetic concepts that we have to be aware is one is do dose stacking. Uh, repeated administration before the peak effect of the previous dose reached uh, causes a lot of side effects. And uh, synergism, combination of drugs, increase the risk of uh, serious side effects. And uh, the ideal sedation drug or the protocol, there's always a search for it. Uh, the ideal situation would be rapid induction and rapid emergence, uh, more like switch on switch off anesthesia. Uh, we need to provide, uh, it needs to provide good anxiolysis, analgesia, and amnesia. Uh, sufficient control of movement to allow for ease of procedural completion, uh, maintain effective spontaneous ventilation and airway control, uh, complete uh, cardiopulmonary stability throughout, uh, and it should have uh, minimal to no side effects. So please uh, have adequate tools of the trade and be very comfortable in knowing those specific drugs because without the right tools for the job, we always end up in situations like this. Uh, the most important implications, even though you might be called for a mild sedation or anything, always assume and prepare for deep sedation. The level of vigilance should always be maximal. Uh, appropriate monitoring equipment, uh, if possible, always include ETCO2 in your uh, kit and uh, adequate trained personnel you should have. Uh, this is uh, a study done by Charles Cote. We had the opportunity of meeting him in a conference. And uh, this is a very famous study where uh, um, around 95 adverse events uh, in pediatric sedation were studied in detail, where uh, 51 deaths and nine permanent neurological injuries were there. So what the study says is mortality is very, very rare in uh, pediatric sedation, whereas morbidity is not uncommon. 
So uh, what they found was uh, drug interactions, like combination of a lot of drugs was the most important uh, cause for uh, uh, those catastrophes. And the next most important cause was <clears throat> drug overdose, inadequate monitoring, inadequate CPR, inadequate anesthesia worker, pre-anesthesia worker, and uh, premature discharge. So you need to know when you can discharge the child. The early, sometimes in uh, 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 non-hospital MRI suits, CT suits, where the anesthetist has to move on, a, free, a good freelancer might be having to move on to the next place. And a premature discharge from that place might cause a lot of problems. And this was very surprising. Inadequate personnel was the cause for around 10 catastrophes. So poor patient selection, drug overdose, lack of appreciation of drug interactions, pharmacokinetics and dynamics, use of multiple medications to sedate patient, which is definitely not necessary, lack of monitoring before, during, and most important after the procedure, and inadequate CPR skills, failure to rescue are the causes of catastrophes. Uh, so conclusions, most complications are avoidable. Monitoring makes a huge difference. Uh, adverse events involve multiple drugs. When we use one or two single drugs, uh, we don't have much problems. Uh, children one to six years are at the greatest risk. And uh, always we need appropriate personal skilled in airway management and resuscitation. So there are a few lessons to learn today, uh, which we'll take home. Uh, study the pharmacology of the drugs you plan on using. Uh, become an expert on a few of these appropriate drugs. Start with small doses and titrate to the effect because each children, each child is different. They come in different shapes, different sizes, different pharmacokinetics, different elimination times, different metabolic uh, metabolisms. So you start small doses and uh, you see how they behave and accordingly you titrate to the effect. And when combining the drugs, please decrease the dose of each component. For example, propofol 2 mg per kg, fentanyl 2 mg per kg, dexmed 2 mg per kg, midazolam uh, 0.1 mg per All these together, if you give, you're going to land up in trouble. What we do is, we when we use two drugs, we reduce the doses by half. When we use three drugs, we reduce the doses by one third. For example, 1 mg propofol, 1 mg ketamine, 1 mic dexmed. So that's how you go. You reduce the dose of each drug. And please learn that sufficient time should elapse before you read those. Suppose the child is moving. Take them deeper with a little of inhalational than, uh, you know, dosing the IV. Tailor your drugs to need. If you don't need an analgesic, for example, uh, in a lot of dental procedures, just a local infiltration would do. You might have to intubate or sedate uh, just for the sake of keeping the child immobile. That does not mean you have to give a narcotic, uh, take them very deep and uh, things like that. So, the, so the, those are the things that will land us in trouble. You keep it simple, you'll be safe. So these are a few tricks of the trade where oxygen press nitrous, a lot of dental procedures, nitrous sedation, yes. And this might be new to you. It's called Cineon, where uh, we use sevoflurane, nitrous, and oxygen, where the plane is even more better. And uh, this you might be aware of, ketamine and midazolam, the hallucinating effects come down. Uh, dexmed and ketamine. Dexmed might reduce the heart rate, whereas ketamine might increase the heart rate, and uh, that will nullify each other. And uh, ketophol, you must all be knowing, propofol can take care of the amnesia, and ketamine can take care of the little pain or the antitussive effect. And sometimes you can use ketophol combined with sevoflurane and fentofol plus propofol for more painful procedures. And for longer procedures, you can use, even use fentanyl and morphine where fentanyl, you can give fentanyl and morphine uh, combined where fentanyl will take care of the immediate pain, whereas morphine takes at least half an hour to start acting. And that will take care of the, uh, uh, the uh, pain after quite a, after some time. And uh, uh, like the ideal drug that we were talking about, remifentanyl, we think will be the closest to an ideal drug of Nora in future India. But uh, the sad part is, though remifentanil was introduced in 1996, and uh, though its patent was ended in 2017, even after 25 years, India still does not have remifentanil in the market. But once we have it, I think remifentanil will be a wonder drug in uh, uh, providing Nora, especially uh, uh, a very safe uh, Nora drug, uh, remifentanil, I can say. I've had the experience of using it abroad. So where we can improve, we can use a lot of uh, topicals for children requiring venipunctures and lumbar punctures. 
uh, when they are very small babies uh, and they are fasted for a long time, we can even think about uh, uh, sucrose uh, pacifiers and always try to have a capnography in our periphery kit. And uh, whenever possible, like I said, uh, local infiltration for wounds with uh, local anesthetics might uh, solve most of the problems. And please don't deny any child of uh, sedation for any painful procedure, like uh, primum non nausea, which is first do no harm. Thank you so much. So uh, here, what I would say is anesthesiologist is the pilot in NORA, and NORA is the takeoff and landing. Wish you all uh, many more happy landings as far as Nora is concerned. And I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the 14th National Pediatric Anesthesia Conference in number Coimbatore. Uh, luckily, this time we're having it in Coimbatore and it's going to be a fantastic uh, uh, India's first sustainable medical conclave. So please try registering. See you all there. Uh, I also take this opportunity to say that we run a one-year pediatric anesthesia fellowship in GKN and Coimbatore. We have two seats per session, one in January and uh, one in July, accredited by the Indian Association of Pediatric Anesthesia. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh, for a clear presentation and with a, loaded with a lot of information. So thank you so much. For wonderful. There are a few questions in the chat box. We will take up the questions one by one. So which LMA you prefer, Dr. Uh, Dinesh? Uh, IGEL or any? Sir, any uh, Procel and IGEL both are good enough, sir. So Sorry, sir. the most important thing in Procel and IGEL is we have a port to deflate the stomach. Endoscopists, they tend to nicely sufflate the stomach, sir. So we have the opportunity to take out the air. Once we take out the air, uh, we have the flexibility of the lung. Otherwise, the lung is fully pushed upwards and we're not able to ventilate. So once we deflate, we are in a better position to ventilate the child, actually, sir. So uh, Procel is the best option. Yeah. So, uh, the pedicloral syrup is uh, traditionally used for a long time in pediatric anesthesia for sedation. So, what is your experience? Still, it is, uh, uh, has any role in the pediatric anesthesia, pedicloral? Pedicloral used to have a very good role, uh, 50 to 100 mg per kg. But now, the latest consensus is, uh, uh, it is carcinogenic, they say, so pedicloral. So, a lot of places, uh, pedicloral is avoided. Especially in the West, they don't use pedicloral anymore, so. If so we have no other option, if we are in a periphery center, because it, is, it, has, it has been used for a longer time, the carcinogenic effect and everything, now only it is coming up. So now only people are talking about it. So if we have no other option, I think we can go for particular. So that's fine. So the carcinogenic effect is uh, due to continuous usage or a single dose? Uh, so they say it is continuous usage. And most of these studies have only been done in animals, rat, mice, and all that. So nobody has tested it in uh, babies, actually. Uh, so, I think we have to use it judiciously, sir. There's nothing to prove in human beings the actual carcinogenicity. Well, there are a lot of other alternatives are available. We can go Why, for Yes, sir. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. So, other question is regarding the DEX kit experience. Uh, yes, sir. DEX kit we use uh, regularly, sir. Where uh, uh, DEXMED... Uh, keeps the child calm, the heart rate is, uh, when the heart rate is coming down, ketamine actually increases the heart rate and uh, it matches for each other. So it's very comfortable to use uh, Dexkeet. And Dexkeet, uh, another most important uh, thing is we combine uh, Dex intranasal, like I showed you, you know, the uh, atomizer. We can just use a normal 2 ml syringe or our insulin syringe. We can connect the atomizer to the tip. And uh, if possible, after a CO, mild uh, CO induction, if you can just spray, uh, the absorption is better sir, than when the child is awake. When the child is awake, if we try to, they might move, they may try to spit it out, they may try to sneeze it out. So make them a little comfortable with uh, CO induction. And then you push uh, uh, Dexmed and Ketamine. Dex, we can, uh, the, uh, we can go up to 2 to 3 mics per kg. Ketamine, again, uh, 2 mg per kg, we can go. But how will you calculate the dose per uh, atomization? Yeah. So we calculate the dose. We take the drug in the 2 ml syringe, sir. And so through the total we, dose in the syringe. Uh, then the total we, dose is just pushed into the nose, actually. Yeah, that's right. So the next question is regarding that only. That is intranasal metazolam for Nora. Metazolam, actually, what it does is it's very stingy to the nose than uh, Dexmed and Ketamine. Uh, midazolam uh, is tolerated less, less by children. It gives a very burning sensation in the nose. 
compared to uh, dexmed and ketamine so we try to avoid metazolam but if there is nothing else available if only metazolam is available just uh, see you and use them and push ketamine and, uh, it's going to be fine but another another important thing is uh, dexmed and ketamine works for just like 15 20 minutes whereas midazolam they say the hangover effect of midazolam in children lasts for a longer time oh. we might think it's a short acting drug yeah. but uh, the metabolism the elimination uh, everything is delayed so they say the same thing for fentanyl also the hangover the analgesic effect lasts in fentanyl lasts for a shorter time whereas the respiratory depression effect of fentanyl lasts for a few hours so is the metabolism of intranasal metazolam is different from uh, iv metazolam no sir iv and intranasal is the same the density of the uh, venous plexus in the intranasal area is as good as iv absorption so your iv absorption and intranasal absorption is very much comparable okay. so the next interesting question does the vaporizer output vary inside the magnetic field of mri oh that, that's a good question so i have uh, no experience i, I also I, we have to go and read but i think that's a nice good thought actually this from muthu kumar we will refer to come to you muthu kumar so the last question is do you have, have you experienced any adverse events in the mri suit if you don't mind you can share with us uh so projectile missiles we've had sir projectile missiles we've had points uh and uh, the worst part is if they have to demagnetize the mri machine for them to again magnetize the mri machine takes a lot of uh, uh, funds it's very expensive to again magnetize the whole machine so that is one thing uh, another thing yes sir, we've had our share of complications like uh, uh, desaturations we've had to go into the uh, this thing and intubate the child we've had arrests we've had bradycardia we've had our share of uh, because we do a lot of volumes uh, mri we've had our share of complications and in fact uh, another thing i wanted to bring uh, to your notice uh, mri and ct uh, for uh, lymphomas we yes that is one interesting complication i want to share actually uh, there was one situation where uh, uh, we just sedated this child and uh, once we sedated the child lost the tone and all the uh, lymphoma started falling on the trachea we were not able to ventilate the child we were uh, we would try we intubated the child still we were not able to ventilate the child and then we found out the lymphomas were compressing the individual right and left bronchi then we had to turn the child to prone left lateral and in one position we were able to ventilate the child and uh, 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 then we reversed the child uh, once the child got back the tone of the musculature uh, they were okay okay Uh, this is last question from me you have mentioned that is morphine with fentanyl but in nora and uh, deca surgery we prefer only the short acting uh, narcotics why in morphine in this uh, nora so there are a few longer procedures sir, in nora that we do so for, for example the cath lab procedures for example uh, there are a few bronchoscopy procedures and stenting all these things takes a longer time sir where we might keep the child intubated for some more time and then next to bit there we use uh, fentanyl and uh, morphine combined actually then you will observe in the post op paper yes sir, observe in the post op later on then it's okay thank you very much sir uh, uh, so professor sir any other questions no sir uh, nice presentation sir very nice very good second topic thank you dr thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you so the i invite the second speaker dr uh, raki goel to our online anesthesia platform she is currently working as director of anesthesia in rainbow children hospital rosewalk by rainbow hospital new new delhi she has received chief of army staff commendation award medal and she is the founder secretary of iapa delhi chapter her area of interest is ultrasound guidance supraglottic airways one lung ventilation and bronchoscopy over to you madam Shilpa. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor Edward Johnson and uh, his team for uh, inviting me to this pediatric anesthesia series. I'm indeed delighted to be a part of it. And today, uh, 
as you know, we are discussing two very special topics, which are simple, yet they can get very tricky and um, possibly unsafe uh, if we don't understand them well. So we are here to discuss NORA and pediatric daycare surgeries. Some of the aspects of these two topics uh, are common and yet they are very different. So in this particular second half, I'm going to talk about anesthesia for pediatric daycare surgeries. I come from um, Rainbow Children's Hospital, uh, New Delhi, and I bring greetings from my institution. So uh, coming to uh, the basic concept of what is daycare, whether it's pediatric or as adult, we must understand what actually daycare surgery means. I, I guess most of you know that uh, the common connotation of daycare is same day admission and same day discharge. Now, this uh, concept of the same day is interpreted a little differently in different parts of the world and within our country in different uh, kind of uh, institutes. So uh, like uh, in the US, 65% of their surgical load is daycare. And they call it daycare if the admission is less than 23 hours. So they are called 23 hours stay. Basically, it's not 24 hours. Um, and this is this huge percentage of daycare, besides other things, is because of a lot of pressure from the insurance companies to reduce the um, costs of, uh, say, a particular surgery. So, so that's one very big reason for daycare surgeries to be encouraged and, as a result, more prevalent in the U.S. Now, when it comes to UK, uh, right now they claim that it is around 50% of their surgical load is daycare and they target their daycare to be 75%. Now, uh, it seems uh, pretty ambitious, but why not? Through this uh, lecture in the next 15, 20 minutes, we'll actually realize that uh, uh, there's so many advantages of daycare and there are so many ways to make it safer that this 75% uh, could actually be achievable. These figures are, of course, for adults, mainly for adults. So when it comes to children, uh, I wouldn't uh, dare to claim such percentage, I must admit. Now. Um, in, in these Western countries, uh, whether it's 23 hour stay or lesser stay or whatever be the reason of the stay, the whole aim is that the care to the patient should meet the same standards as it would have been an inpatient. So which means the daycare should be equal to, if not better, than the regular patients who stay overnight. And obviously, that, that goes without saying that uh, no corners to be cut. The care should be of utmost standards. Now, so this was in the Western world. I've just given examples of uh, two major countries that uh, we often talk about uh, and compare uh, when we have to talk about countries other than our own. So when it comes to our own country, how is it different? So uh, one, we don't really have a clear data, a clear percentage of what and how and uh, you know what kind of daycare we have because our healthcare is pretty diversified. The government institutions, there are some semi-government, they're private, they're corporate, they're nursing homes. 
so uh, so we don't have one policy as of now but that's okay so uh, mostly in the government institutions the patients stay overnight but then the daycare concept has um, come in and it's i think it's progressing very fast now uh, in private and corporate yes uh, because of the cost there's such alarming cost that the patients themselves want an early discharge whereas uh, the insurance patients those who are covered by insurance company what we have seen that a 24 hour stay is uh, mostly in with all insurance companies is mandatory so so that's counter uh, our concept of daycare so as i said it's it's a very mixed and diversified uh, kind of healthcare practice so um, there it is now duration of stay as i said um, insurance companies they want more than 24 hours but when we otherwise a non-insured uh, patient comes like in my hospital the daycare means six hours stay anything more than six hours probably the patient would be charged for the overnight costs so um, it's the timing is set in such a way that the patient from admission to discharge does not cross six hours unless of course there is some indication and um, then there is a financial implication of course now um, in other countries there's a follow-up by hospital staff once the patient goes home but in our our country uh, i'm really not sure how much is the follow we'll talk about it uh, eventually and what is the backup healthcare facility near the patient's home so these two are very important things and we will talk about it as we go on now, obviously, it's very obvious that uh, there are a lot of advantages of daycare surgeries. Now, um, we when we talk about pediatric daycare, we know that if it's a daycare, we don't have to really depend on the availability of hospital beds. That could be really challenging in uh, some of our government hospitals, even in some of the busy private hospitals. So if there is no bed, there is no worry. It's a daycare, patient comes, gets operated, and goes home. Really doesn't need an overnight bed. You can uh, schedule surgeries with more flexibility. There is, uh, since the child is not staying in the hospital, the hospital acquired infections are possibly going to be less. There, um, the surgical waiting list gets shortened because uh, Mm, the patients are not admitted, they're not uh, due for their follow-ups in the wards, the discharges, and the whole process as we know. So basically, the, the waiting in the list can be shortened if we increase the number of daycares. And when the hospital stays shortened, uh, the overall cost naturally would be less. I mean, the, it's phenomenal. The The cost reduction is phenomenal in daycare versus in patients who are going to stay a day extra or, or more. So uh, you can have, any institute can have a higher volume of patients and therefore higher efficiency with the same infrastructure, with the same manpower, you could have more. Now, when it comes to children, I think when the child goes home after a procedure, uh, he or she feels uh, much better recovering in a familiar environment. That's home. You know, you have your own room, you, you have your own bed, your own toys, and uh, maybe your own um, TV shows, you know, Peppa Pig and frozen and whatnot so if i were a kid even as an adult i would definitely like to come back to my own room in my house and recover there rather than um, uh, spend hours in a 
drab hospital bed with uh, strange people in strange clothes around me. So with children, definitely uh, uh, the home environment is more comfortable and comforting, I would say. And overall, if we see in a country like ours, where uh, there is so much, so much of a dearth of healthcare uh, facility, if we see overall, then if we encourage daycare, we will save a lot of, um, you know, funds, um, the national funds, which could help in the economic growth of the nation. Ultimately, that is. Now, obviously, uh, if it was so good, uh, every surgery would have been daycare. So there is a downside to daycare surgeries in children, because especially in children, uh, the the incidence of unplanned readmissions would definitely be high. You know, there could be surgical complications, there could be anesthesia complications, the, the child may simply have uh, emergence which is not settling. So uh, even minor reasons would uh, be a major reason for a readmission when it comes to especially smaller children. Now, uh, if I'm operating on a child, I and, and I want to send him home the same day, uh, the whole team would need higher expertise level. You got to give uh, absolutely optimal of everything. Anything uh, less or more would uh, not ready the patient, the child for discharge from the hospital so early. Uh, Another aspect is the uh, uh, PSE, the pre-anesthetic checkup. When, uh, when we think that it's just a daycare, it's likely, just likely and possibly there are chances of uh, a slight overlook. Negligence is a very harsh term. I think a few things may be overlooked because it's not a major case. So that part we should keep in mind, you know, a small thing like a loose tooth, uh, probably NPO, um, even the parents may take uh, that procedure a little lightly because they think it's just coming in the morning and going after a couple of hours. So it's no big deal. So your uh, the instructions you've given about the NPO, the fasting, um, it may include other things as well. So that possibly uh, may be taken lightly by the parents, the staff, you yourself. So um, that part we should remember. I think that's very important. And uh, there is, as, as we say, there is no short GA and no short case. So we should really remember that. Another point, I think, um, I think it's most important is to understand that uh, daycare, uh, children for daycare will be accompanied by parents who would have higher anxiety levels because they haven't got time. They have not been uh, admitted a day prior. They probably admitted 15 minutes prior to the procedure. So they, they're not mentally prepared. They've not settled in the hospital. So uh, they'll be very, very anxious. And so would be the child, you know. So um, as anesthetists, we'll have to deal with more anxiety. We, we should know that. So in 2016, the um, Royal Medical uh, College in the UK came up with these advisory called Choosing Wisely pertaining to take care surgeries. This advisory for all the clinicians and the caregivers. And uh, I thought uh, it's very apt, you know, because the whole crux of uh, giving a safe uh, care to children on a daycare uh, basis is to choose wisely. 
Now, what to choose? Both the patient, you have to choose the patients wisely and the procedures wisely, depending on your infrastructure, your staffing, the kind of facility you have on that day. So, um, commonly, we would prefer uh, procedures that are going to be on the peripheries and not involving body cavities like I wouldn't prefer a daycare uh, when it comes to a laparotomy or a thoracotomy. But if it's um, something on, you know, one of the fingers, one of the toes or uh, uh, a lump or uh, maybe an IND on one of the peripheries, uh, it could possibly be yes. Duration of the procedure. Obviously, we will not like to go in for a procedure which is, say, more than two hours and uh, then try to send the child home. No. Daycares are for short duration procedure. Now, two hours is not a magic figure. You, you have to take um, all things into consideration and then decide whether uh, that duration is short or not so long. Now, um, we must see that what is the anticipated pain post-procedure? Uh, for example, if it's an IND, the, the child would come in pain, but after the IND, the pain would become better. It will be less than before. And oral analgesics will probably be enough. So that is fine for daycare. But a, in a surgery where uh, there is considerable uh, mm, pain, like uh, say an osteotomy, which is very painful, uh, we even if it's a short procedure, we won't want to send the child home the same day. So post-op pain, the anticipated post-op pain, uh, that part should be uh, kept in mind very seriously. Minimal physiological disturbances. Obviously, if if there is a huge fluid shift, if there is uh, uh, blood loss, considerable blood loss in the surgery, um, you know, so uh, we wouldn't want to send the child home. Ability to take orally. Now that's very important. You can't send a child who is not able to drink or eat anything. Uh, they they can't be on IV fluids at home, so we must ensure that um, uh, the anesthesia and surgery, whatever they've undergone, post that they sh are able to uh, drink water, drink fluids, and able to take orally. Only then we should choose them for daycare surgeries. Now, uh, when it comes to very small children. We must see uh, whether they were uh, full term or preterm. Now, uh, uh, you know, premenstrual age, uh, postmenstrual age of 44 weeks, which means, uh, say, the baby was born at 38 and now it's six weeks. So that's okay for uh, for a small procedure or an ex preemie who is now more than 60 weeks, like uh, was born say 30 weeks and now 30 more weeks have gone by. So a total of 60 weeks. So, so these two scenarios, so they have to be more than this to be probably qualified for a daycare. The second aspect is uh, where are you doing it? Now, these preemies, neonates, um, or, or uh, smaller infants should be done as daycare only in tertiary units. Now, if it's not a tertiary unit, then you really have to uh, see that uh, these 44 and 60 weeks are not enough. Then. In, in other units which are not tertiary for pediatric, the age should be definitely more. And it goes without saying that history of OSA is a no-no for daycare uh, surgeries. If the child has a history of OSA, we would not prefer a 
uh, daycare for obvious reasons. Uh, so uh, let's come in. Uh, let's come and see the common daycare procedures. So uh, I'm sure you all are familiar with the non-surgical procedures. Now these are very very common: GI endoscopies, uh, radiological procedures like uh, CT scan, MRI, cardiac cath, radiotherapy, some onco procedures where they just inject some uh, drug intrathecally or or take us you know bone marrow sample um, there could be some ortho procedures like just a cast application or uh, some injections into the joints or some renal uh, thing where they do eswl for for the stones or it could be a dermatology um, procedure like uh, laser treatment for some le lesions so these are pretty common procedures where a child would need uh, sedation, probably uh, moderate to deep, but then maybe uh, really fit for a daycare uh, basis. When it comes to actual surgical procedures, uh, we should have these things in mind. I have not listed the name of the surgeries because there are too many factors uh, that determine. If it's say, I'll just give you an example. If it's a herniotomy in a child, uh, is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? Is it lap laparoscopic? Is it open? Uh, how old is the child? Uh, who is doing it? What is the duration of the surgery? Um, was it planned laparoscopically, but they opened it, so you know it really is not minimally invasive. Um, is there any chance of uh, urinary retention that requires catheterization? So uh, most most of it, things can be different. So uh, so that's the reason I've not named the surgery. So these are the factors, surgical factors that you need to know when accepting a child for daycare. The other factors, uh, surgical factors being, if there's a risk of post-op uh, bleed or you're putting a drain or a risk of, say, there's a tibial fracture, there's a risk of compartment syndrome, risk of DVT, uh, a need for IV fluids or uh, IV antibiotics, then, uh, you know, so these are not, not the cases where you would consider daycare. Now, okay, so surgery, uh, you've decided on the surgery, or maybe the surgeon has decided that uh, we'll go in for daycare. So uh, when it comes to PSE, what do we do? So these short procedures usually do not come physically for a PSE. So the two ways of going about it, either you do a tele-PSE or they self-report. So depending on the system that you have, if you have a system of a physical PSE, that's well and good. Uh, they could all be in, in some of the Western countries, they're screening by the primary care providers. And uh, you could take uh, help uh, by the internet or the intranet. So um, a PSE can be done. Basically, a PSE can be done and should be done. And uh, you should realize that uh, it should be cleared well because there are implications of cancellations, and that could be huge. I think uh, most PSE instructions should be given, uh, particularly in, in these times, as a PDF. We have, like for children, we have a complete a detailed uh, PDF uh, which has all the instructions, both anesthesia and surgery in one document. And we give that document, we have the hard copy and the soft copy. So depending on the patient's choice, we give it to them. Even if the procedure is short, it's daycare. I think the instructions, as I said, the care has to be the same. So uh, the instructions also have to be followed to the T. Now we must uh, take the contact number of parents, uh, especially in daycare, because uh, because post of follow up is extremely important, and uh, someone from the team, be it a nurse or a technician or is an anesthetist, should call up and follow up the patient after discharge. So we must have the contact number of the parents. 
Now, a few questions uh, that come to our mind is, if it's a very short surgery, do you need any investigations uh, preoperatively? Now, um, like in my institution, we do not ask for um, investigations. Suppose it's a small IND or um, say, uh, uh, say toenail repair or some, some you know, endoscopy. Uh, if the patient has already got the investigations done, well and good. Otherwise, we see physically whether there's pallor or in the history there is something or physically if there is something only then we ask for investigations otherwise we don't but there is no harm in getting your standard uh, investigations done as per your hospital protocol or departmental protocol another question which is very tricky is a child with urti say it's um, hernia and there is a runny nose would you accept the child for a daycare surgery it's a yes and a no both so uh i'll leave that to your department because that's a call that's a collective call between your department and the surgical department and you should take it together of course along with the parents of the child no pre preparation is um, is same as uh, you would do for uh, uh, you know a non daycare uh, patient so i would not go into details uh, i would more be interested in the pre medication now uh, i think uh, it's best not to give uh, any pre medication because mostly you'll give orally or nasally and that could linger even if i give short acting drugs they're likely to linger on for some time so routinely uh, i would not like to give i would rather use uh, alternatives like distraction or um, inhalational induction with parental presence that's what we routinely do at our institutes so i would not really depend on drugs but yes if required uh, we could go ahead but remember that they should be all very short acting otherwise uh, discharge on the same day could be challenging now induction and maintenance also Th these are the things that came to my mind now uh, Obviously, you will induce with short-acting drugs. You will uh, go uh, low on opioids. Uh, Propofol uh, is the induction agent, which is short-acting. Opioids, uh, you can probably give a short-acting fentanyl, but it's best avoided, I think. Uh, when it comes to airway devices, uh, you can tube the child, but I would prefer a supraglottic device or simply a TIVA. Now, for most procedures can be done under TIVA. So lesser handling of the airway, lesser complications. But yes, if an airway device is indicated, we should uh, go ahead with it. Now, I'm also worried about the post-op nausea vomiting. So uh, I would avoid nitrous oxide and uh, probably opioids as well so uh, you can take a call on that but we should certainly avoid uh, post of nausea vomiting if you're planning to send the child home the same day fluids also we should uh, give enough so that uh, immediate post op the iv fluids are not required and we give enough time for the child to settle in and start taking orally Prevention of emergence delirium. I think this is the most important factor that we should keep in mind because uh, these days when we use sevoprorene all the time, there is a problem with emergence and uh, that could really delay the admission. So uh, we, should, uh, we, sh we should take care of it and not send the child if there is emergence uh, present. When it comes to analgesia, now if we are cutting down on opioids, what do we give? It's either 
NSAIDs, paracetamol depends on the um, age of the child, whatever is safe or a combination. And some regional blocks can be given. Now, uh, local infiltration analgesia is the safest and non-controversial. But when it comes to peripheral nerve blocks or a simple caudal, uh, uh, I think that's a call you should take. Do you really want to give that? Um, I would not prefer a central block. I would prefer a, maybe a USG guided peripheral nerve block. Where? Why USG guided? Because then I'll need to give a very, very small amount of drug in a very specific region which would probably not cause any urinary retention, any toxicity, drug toxicity. So it would add a lot of safety and it would give good analgesia. So uh, overall, if I have to give a regional block, uh, besides local infiltration analgesia, I would prefer a USG guided peripheral nerve block, which is very specific to the procedures. Otherwise, I'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, rely on IV paracetamol and IV NSAIDs, unless contraindicated. Extubation should always be smooth, whether it's deep or awake is the same uh, when it comes to daycare or otherwise, but we want to send the child home, so we should keep time as on our mind, yes. Now, uh, post anesthesia care unit is the most important place uh, where you have to decide whether this child is ultimately fit. Even if the child is scheduled for daycare surgery, before you send, you have to take a call whether the child is fit to go home or not. So pain, PONB, excessive somnolence, um, these are important things. Um, uh, hemodynamic monitoring, SpO2 should be okay, heart rate should be okay, blood pressure should be okay, should be able to avoid urine, should be able to take water, and ultimately should meet the discharge criteria. Now, this is just an example of um, PACU discharge criteria, but you can have your own criteria, you can have your modified criteria, and see what bets uh, works for you. But before the child goes, the child should be awake, active, should be able to ambulate, should be able to drink and eat and should not have pain, nausea, vomiting, should not be bleeding from the surgical site. Uh, that's how we say. And then should not have emergence. That's when we say that the child is fit to go home. Now here, uh, things are not as simple as we see. There's a, there, there can be troubleshooting. If there is inadequate analgesia, the child is in pain, it will result in readmission. You've given a caudal uh, block and there is urinary retention, there could be a delay or a readmission. If the child, you've added probably clonidine or dexmedetomidine to your caudal or, or you've given some um, opioid, the child could be sleeping too much in the PACO and you can't discharge. So there's a delay. The child may be vomiting and uh, they may, it, it may or may not delay or readmission, but it will certainly have a poor overall satisfaction, especially by the parents. Emergence we've already talked about. Now any respiratory complications, surgical complications will definitely cause a delay or or readmission as a full-time admission. So th this chart, I took it from an article, which is the same thing as we talked about, but they you know, very systematically they have put as component of process and outcome measure. So suppose uh, the booking process, there was a problem in the uh, booking process. Uh, the outcome measure was patients failing to attend for surgery. You booked a case for daycare, but the patients haven't um, reported in time. Pre-op preparation, the, again, the patients have cancelled or they have come late. So the pre-op prep couldn't be done. Admission process, now that affects the theater start times. So if there is a delay in the documentation or, uh, or anything in the admission process, the, the schedule time in the OT gets uh, disrupted. 
now quality of anesthesia also any any lapse in the quality there would be a delay or an unplanned admission same for recovery same um, for discharge process now there would be unplanned um, mm, uh, if, if the discharge process has not been robust the parents of the child are going to keep calling the hospital and that's going to be a problem for everyone now uh post of follow-ups that i was talking about initially now uh if uh, there is a lapse in that if somebody from the team has not called up and found out uh, there can be a problem then the parents would start calling for uh, repeatedly and there could be a disruption in your um, you know process now audits uh, uh, if uh, I'll, I'll come to it here so overall daycare if i have to make it effective and safe it's it's very important that we have regular clinical audits we have processes that uh, lead to quality improvement we have a lot of teaching and training because the whole team not just the anesthetists the surgeons your technicians nurses uh, the admin staff they all need to be tuned into this uh, process of daycare uh, because if uh, it's it's a chain now any weak link in the chain could be the uh, problem so uh, the you know in the west they have dedicated daycare units so everyone is trained in that uh, system everyone is trained uh, and that's how it runs uh, very smoothly so that's, and this is a continuous uh, process. It's dynamic that you keep teaching and training and improving, you know, and repeat. And then um, the strength in following up the patients. The child has gone home. Everything was perfect through the uh, day and the child's gone home, but not been followed up. So that could lead to a lot of problems. So follow up whether it's telephonic or somebody goes and checks up it's extremely important and one more thing which i haven't talked about uh, earlier is when you send the child home in fact when you book the patient for daycare you should see uh, whether uh, where is their house and uh, what kind of uh, emergency healthcare facility is nearby because if there is a problem uh, are they very far from your hospital or somebody close by can attend to them you know so that part is also your responsibility as a team of course so we must take so the whole idea is to make uh, more and more cases daycare to decrease the cost increase the uh, efficiency increase the satisfaction and yet keep it safe I think in our country, we will reach there and with uh, a lot of efforts and, and what we are having right now, the teaching and training part, we will get there um, soon. And uh, I hope uh, this talk at least stimulated all of you to go more pro towards uh, daycare, even if it's a child in your care. Thank you for a patient hearing and I would love to take uh, questions after the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goel. So it's a very wonderful presentation with a lot of information. So the, there is no questions in the chat box. So I think you are in out of country. <laughs> Hello, you joined. Yes, good morning, everyone. I, I'm at Istanbul right now, but okay. uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see you all and uh, I'm glad uh, I could record and give you the talk. But if there are any questions, any comments, I would right, be very I happy thought to you were out that. of country and I didn't I increase the questions for the discussion. But anyway, no so worries. Hard. People can still ask or uh, or we can have uh, an interaction if anybody wants. Yes, ma'am. So, in, in your experience, uh, you go for only the procedural. Uh, uh, 
anesthesia or you will go for interventional anesthesia or for the take up no so so uh, it's it's not like you mean only procedural sedation uh, it has to be considered no no so it's beyond that it's it's beyond that it's not just uh, parental sedation for day care we do uh, a lot of surgeries which are day care because uh, thankfully now most of our drugs are very short acting and uh, we can go uh, low on opioids and in a lot of cases we don't have to give opioids if we are thinking of day care there you know, we have nsaids we have very good paracetamol we can have local infiltration some some short acting lesion block so uh, it's not just sedation it's proper ga proper ga also can go home and they routinely do do you practice uh, cardal anesthesia for later surgeries we usually don't we don't uh, unless the case was done in the morning and we have a good couple of hours if i'm doing a coral then i don't add any uh, drug to it it's just local anesthetic and ropivacaine is pretty good uh, we don't have a urinary tension so it's it's not a clear cut yes and a no answer but yes you should see if i'm doing a case in the afternoon i would probably not give a coral with a uh, minadetic can we go for any other nerve blocks for the post op analgesia yeah, before discharge discharge the patient yes yes a single shot nerve block never hurts uh, it's all under ga and we should give because after all you don't want the child to go home and cry and the parents giving you a call and you know, nothing much you can do there is no iv access at home and and in india we don't have a system to send a nurse home uh, to give anything so like in other countries they have a follow up by the nurse after the day care the nurse calls up looks up the patient advises we don't yet have a system uh, like that so so we call up and we give an um, duty number so that the parents can call us up and uh, uh, let us know so you are following the daily follow for the patients Uh, yes they cares who go home uh, they definitely need to be followed on the phone we can't just leave them on their own uh, because anything going wrong will be responsible and we don't want that and we don't want any trouble with the patient either and we when you're doing a kid you want the kid to be very good you don't want the kid to have any troubles at home so a lot of uh, counseling a lot of time goes in counseling uh, we counsel the surgeon counsels we counsel again then in pre op in post op and finally when they are going home we we uh, reinforce the same counseling and we have made a pdf document uh, so that the surgeon and us we talk the same language now if i say you can have a, a say a, a meal after 2 hours and the surgeon says no after 6 hours the parents will be all confused what do i do at home so we talk the same language after every single case we we decide okay what are we going to tell the parents and and usually we counsel together we go together in counsel and and think that's made a lot of difference uh to work as a team when you counsel the post op together so so you need bit, to educate say, patients you need to educate the patients uh i think this is very basic uh, so long as you can connect to a patient from a rural area also um, it's all about connecting with the uh, mother or the father so i think uh, they all understand when it comes to their children's safety is what every parent understands there is uh, and we don't use uh, technical terms either way it's we tell in very simple terms uh, that the patient the parent can understand it's just you need a little more time and patience for that that's all definitely definitely madam that is sir professor sir any questions sir that is sir ma'am one no sir it was a very nice presentation and my my experience with uh, uh, day care in pediatrics is so low i don't have much to ask but it was a very nice uh, enlightening presentation probably when i get next case next time i will i'll be very uh, uh easily going through these cases sir. thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you and i want to tell you that all infants for short procedures please let them breastfeed in your recovery room it it's magical they 
they don't uh, consume much milk but it's so uh, kind of calming and um, it also has analgesic effect so they're like you don't have to give too much of analgesia so all infants or around that age who are on breastfeed we insist that the mother feeds them in the post op room and nobody nobody vomits if you have not done a laparotomy you not touch the gut they don't vomit as most of the anesthesia is we prefer daycare surgery for the adult so for the pediatrics we have to learn a lot thank you so much madam <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed. So, yes, thank you so much. The difficulty in doing the surgery in pediatrics you highlighted very nicely. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dinesh, Dr. Goyal, for a wonderful presentation of this week. So we will come to the end of this session today. Next week we are having interesting uh, topic of uh, fetal emergencies by Dr. Anjali Gupta and uh, intra that is fetal surgeries by Rajneshmi Madam from uh, Ames. we will meet next week thank you all the concerned once again i wish you all a happy world anesthesia day okay. thank you thank you thank you very much sir sir thank you a1 logics thank you sir anesthesia tv and akrona thank you